welcome to another Chancel Chat. My name is Dane Boston. I'm the rector of Christ Church Cooperstown. It's been a while since I've been able to make one of these videos, um, but I'm coming to you from the chancel of St. Agnes Chapel, a much smaller, more intimate chancel than over in the church. Uh, and I thought it might be a nice thing to explore the meaning and the significance of some of the vestments that are worn in the Eucharistic service. As some of you who have watched our Sunday service videos know, we are in the process of renewing our vestments here at Christ Church, replacing some that really need to be replaced, um, and sort of acquiring some substitute sets for others that we can have a, a greater abundance of vestments to use and therefore take the pressure off of some that get used very frequently. And I, I thought it might be helpful to talk through some of the uh, vestments that are worn on a typical weekly basis, daily basis, when the Eucharist is celebrated. Now, in our ordinary services, I'm, I'm officiating at the daily office of morning and sometimes evening prayer. And the vesture for that is distinct from what we have in the Eucharist. But we'll, we'll see how there are some connections and, uh, and, and points of similarity. I also should note that the use of Eucharistic vestments was basically unknown in the Anglican Communion, the Episcopal Church, uh, from which we uh, have our uh, background and, and basis, from the time of the Reformation until the middle of the 19th century. Um, and even after that point, Eucharistic vestments, the full array of Eucharistic vestments that you'll see today, were really a sign of high churchmanship or Anglo-Catholic worship. Um, and were not common in most parishes of the Episcopal Church until the middle to the second half of the 20th century. So while these vestments are themselves very ancient and they have um, a very long heritage and pedigree in the use of the Church, uh, they are in some ways still relatively new to uh, restored use in the churches of the Anglican Communion. So all vesture begins with the most basic garment that we have for priests, uh, bishops, deacons, uh, servers, acolytes, choristers, you know, most everybody who serves in church um, has at some time or another had occasion to wear what I'm wearing right now, which is called a cassock. It's a long ankle length coat, more or less. In the Anglican tradition, it's typically double breasted, but it doesn't have to be. You can have one long row of buttons down the, down the front. Um, I like just having nice four buttons, two at the shoulders and two at the middle, um, and the Anglican double breasted cassock. And this is a common item of dress. It does not indicate ordination because plenty of acolytes wear it, plenty of choristers wear it. So on top of this basic everyday garment that historically could have been worn in the streets, and I've even been known once or twice to wear my cassock um, out and about in Cooperstown. It always attracts some attention. Um, but having the, the Eastern Orthodox Jordanville Monastery not too far up the road, it doesn't attract as much attention as you might think in this village because we've seen other people in cassocks out and about before. So on top of this ordinary dress, uh, there is almost always, in every form of vesture that you come across, uh, first some white garments that are placed, right? some clean, bright, white garments. On the one hand, those have great historical, biblical significance. We, we remember the sort of garments that are worn by the priests of the temple in Jerusalem, uh, the priests of the Jewish tradition in the Old Testament. And we think of the, the white garments described in the book of Revelation, of the saints um, that have come through the tribulation and have washed their garments uh, in the blood of the Lamb, making them white. We also think of the tradition of the church in placing a white uh, garment on those who are newly baptized. Um, that's a very old tradition uh, that, that is in some ways retained for us in our practice of baptizing infants when little children come for baptism in a long white gown. Um, historically, people were baptized naked and then this white garment was placed on them afterwards. So we all begin with a simple white garment. Now, when I celebrate or officiate, I should say, the daily office, that white garment is uh, called a surplice. It's large and flowing, has big, wide sleeves, and nothing around the middle. When I come to celebrate the Holy Eucharist, I go to an older uh, vestment in the surplice. Um, we, we have what's called the alb. But before I put on the alb, I'm going to have one garment that takes care of protecting all the others that will go underneath it. And that's called an amice. It's this either rectangular or sometimes square piece of cloth that I will put on, like thus. It's a, uh, I get some pretty good looks of this when people wander through the sacristy before or after services. They think I'm, you know, play acting at a nun or something, but um, this is an amice. 
The traditional prayers associated with the Amis talk about the helmet of salvation that may repel the assaults of the devil. That's wonderful imagery for us to hold on to, but the reality is the Amis is just a neckcloth to keep my sweat um, from getting on the other garments that I'll put on. So after the Amis is on, then comes the Alb. Now the Alb gets its name from the Latin word Albus, which just means white. So it's a long white garment that will cover the whole of my cassock. So now I have on the basic undergarments uh, for the vestments, the first layer of vestments. Now you can see here how similar the alb looks to a surplice. The sleeves are closer, but the body is nice and loose, and we can see the connection between the two. The alb was the uh, more historic garment dating back to the Roman Empire. And in the churches of Northern Europe, when uh, monks and priests were going into the church on a regular basis, into an unheated church, to say offices at all times of the day and night, they would always throw on an owl on top of their bulky uh, uh, surplice, or excuse me, of their bulky cassock. And their cassocks were bulky because they were fur-lined. They had to keep warm in that. So over time, the surplice developed as an easier alternative to the owl, with looser sleeves and easier to pull over your head. It did the same function of covering the, the everyday garment in a nice, white, clean, bright garment, um, but it was easier to take on and off through all those surfaces. So, on top of the alb goes the girdle. And again, there's lovely prayers associated with uh, the, the donning of the girdle about um, self-restraint and self-control and the, the, the uh, c control of our, of our various lusts and appetites as human beings. Um, but the real function that it performs is to keep all of the upper vestments in place, um, to give a nice definition to the alb, and then to keep the other vestments in place. So once the girdle is on, then we move on to a very recognizable garment called the stole. Now priests, of course, wear the stole, priests and bishops wear the stole over their shoulders. Um, deacons wear the stole over their left shoulder, um, you know, fastened here under their right arm, which leaves their right arm free to help with all the work that they need to do in setting the table and other you know, diaconal duties around the church. Um, priests and deacons wear it this way. I've heard various explanations for the history of the stole. Um, some connect them to the customary uh, sort of scarf uh, or garment worn by teachers in the ancient world. Um, they certainly, it certainly has a, a very dignified drape in this way and, and uh, is immediately recognizable as a, a priestly garment. Um, again, when it's worn with choir dress, if for any reason you're not wearing your hood and tippet, the academic regalia that I wear for the offices, um, but say you're preaching at a service but not celebrating or otherwise doing anything sacramental, it's customary to just let the stole hang loose. But when priests wear it underneath the chasuble, the larger garment we'll see in a moment, it's typically crossed at the chest. Now, one garment that you don't see very much anymore in the life of the church, but that is very much a, a, an important and integral part of the traditional vesture of the church, is called a maniple. Now, historically, this maniple had um, a really useful function. It was a napkin. <laughs> it was a towel that could be used either to presumably dab the celebrant's brow or clean up any messes um, that needed to be addressed. Um, think of a waiter in a restaurant with a towel over his or her uh, wrist in this way. That's what the maniple began life as, and over time, um, they began to make it out of the same precious materials that the rest of the vestments are made out of, and it became purely decorative. That's why in the last couple of decades, it's been discarded uh, by quite a few vestment makers and by parishes. Um, but you know, to my mind, if we're going to wear traditional vestments, then we ought to include all of the things that are part of the tradition. So once these items are on, now it's time for the one that covers them all. Um, this is called the chasuble. Now, chasuble, as you can see, is like a large poncho-like garment that fits over the head and drapes on top of everything else. There are different styles of chasuble, some uh, from the, especially from the Counter-Reformation tradition, um, can become a very elaborately what's called fiddleback, so they're very, very close to the body and have be cutouts so they kind of make the shape of a fiddle. Um, this is more in the style uh, that is called Gothic or semi-Gothic, a, a large flowing chasuble, um, which was common in the Middle Ages and before the Reformation 
in many parts of the church. It descends to us from um, a, an outer garment worn in the Roman world, um, a sort of riding cloak or, or otherwise everyday cloak um, that many people would have worn in the, in the earliest days of the church, the first centuries of the church. And the church, in its sort of general conservatism towards matters of dress, retained it even after it had ceased to be ordinary, um, everyday wear for most people. So this is uh, the, the full array of vestments typically worn for the celebration of the Holy Eucharist. There are other items that I've made reference to in the course of this little chat, um, or that you may have seen before, items like a cope, a large cape, usually richly embroidered, that is used for processions and on other festal occasions. Um, there's all kinds of different headgear, which gets us into some real, you know, that's, that's them fighting words in, in church circles to talk about what kind of hat a priest should wear. I'm not going to worry about that today. Um, these are the basic items that you may see in a typical parish of the Episcopal Church or the Roman Catholic Church, um, in some Lutheran congregations um, and other denominations that use Eucharistic vestments. These are the, 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 the ordinary array of these things. And what they do is they help to beautify our worship, to signify the season of the church year in which we find ourselves, to add dignity and grace and a measure of anonymity to all those who are celebrating, remind, reminding me that it's not just Dane Boston up here at the Eucharist, but I'm standing here uh, as a priest of the Church of God and standing here to present the gifts of God to the people of God. So we dress the same as any other priest might dress for occasions like this. Um, and we're honoring the heritage of our history and also a biblical mandate that expects the people of God to be attired in festal garments, in, in joyful um, showing forth of what we are carrying in our hearts, you know, finding a way of expressing that physically, which we do through our vestments. So thank you so much for watching this little video. I hope uh, if you would like to comment or ask a question, uh, please do so. Um, subscribe if you haven't subscribed to our videos. And if it's possible for you to make a contribution to the vestment renewal effort here at Christ Church Cooperstown, please visit our website, www.christchurchcooperstown.org. Um, you'll find the Give option on the top bar. Simply click on that and you'll find a, a way of giving electronically or you'll find the address for sending in a physical um, uh, check or contribution and remember that you can make that contribution in memory of someone, in honor of someone, uh, or in thanksgiving for some important event in your life. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll look forward to seeing you again in another Chancel Chat very soon.